Welcome to a new series that digs into the incredible beers and stories of the Trappist breweries. These are beers made within the walls of a Trappist monastery by or under the supervision of monks and purely for the upkeep of the monk's way of life or good causes. Despite that, or maybe because of that, they have had a huge impact on how and what we drink today. Some of the best beers in the world come from Trappist breweries, but not a huge amount is known about them due to the limited access lay people have to them and a little bit of that classic Belgian brewing mysticism. We hope one day to visit as many as will let us in, but for now, we're going to be taking you through them one by one to give you the history, the impact, and of course the flavours that they have given the world, all from our own place of worship, the Brudio. Welcome back to part two, the rich and storied history of Shimei Johnny. Uh, end of part one, we were kind of left in 1948. Yep. Was that 80 years ago almost? Something like that. 70 yeah. odd years ago. 1948, they came out with two new beers. They had an Easter beer and a Christmas beer. Where do we go from there? Yeah, so that was their kind of reset after World War II. Uh, and things went really well for a decade and a half. Essentially, they've sort of paid off all the investments that they've made. They've done really well. They've made enough money. They're done rebuilding the monastery after what happened in World War II. And so they're actually left with a bit of a decision to make. And we've seen this in pretty much all of the stories that we've told in this series, which is that they get a bit too big for their boots. And, you know, West Valletta in 1945 or 46, um, they weren't affected by World War II as much as the others. And they actually, you know, they sold the rights of the beer after St. Bernardus and contracted because yes. it was distracting them. Um, and a couple of other monasteries made that decision. Shime went the other way, and so did Westmaller. They thought that we can continue to make money, we can try and distance the monks as far as possible from the day-to-day -day of it and focus on what they need to do, but we can keep raising money because all of the profits were going to their way of life or good causes, good causes or charities. Yeah. So a couple of breweries went that way and went, well, the more money we raise, the better for our community. And remember... This comes from a place, Shime comes from a place of trying to support its local community, which was in dire straits in the mid-1960s. All they had was marshland and mountains. John. Marshland, mountains and a lot of stones. Rubbish. So Shime sort of built on this notion that it's all about supporting the local community as well as the actual monastery. And I think that's what led to the decision to pretty much go hell for leather, right? To go like, we're going to grow as big as we want to. And they made some pretty savvy investments. They bought distribution arms and they um, <clears throat> actually moved the packaging element of their brewing business out and made it a lay person business. So they still dealt with the brewing of it, but they then shipped it off and somebody else did with, dealt with that, with the distribution, with the selling, all of that kind of stuff. So they could sort of keep their principles of the manual work of the brewery um, and the day-to-day -day management of that while letting it expand because the rest of the funnel was dealt with elsewhere. These are like, they're almost like stockbroker monks. They're diversifying monks. <laughs> they're savvy monks. They're this like, t-shirt we're going to make of all the different yeah. monks is just getting out of control. We're going to be on the back soon. They're doing it for good, but they're making serious wedge. Yeah. And but not for themselves. But not for themselves. Well, I don't know that. They might be sat on gold thrones with Got gold some, bibles and gold cloaks. I don't know. Have some I don't Cal think so. Calvin Klein's under their robes, I reckon by the, by gold, this point. Gold labels. They <laughs> They don't come cheap. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this one before we dig into where Shimei took their remarkable commercial success. So Shimei Gold uh, has a kind of long heritage of it. It is the beer that the monks have always drunk. I think it used to be like the second runnings of maybe the blue or the red. But now it is its own beer um, that the monks themselves drink. They don't really touch this stuff. Um, and that they also sell out into the trade as well. So this is, you know, the it's a pater's beer. But this is their session beer that the monks drink. This is their liquid bread type beer. Liquid bread style beer, yeah. I like it. Big and fruity, right? I like it, yeah, yeah. So West Mala Extra, which is the Peter's beer from West Mala, is kind of more muted, kind of more grainy. This one is big East aromas. And yeah. a very different East aroma to these two. None of that meatiness. No meaty boys. Just very, very pear and herbal as well. I would not be surprised if this has herbs added to it because it is very, very floral and fragranced. Perfumey almost. Mm. So like lemon, rosemary, lemon barley, you know, squash kind of vibes. 
lovely soft mouthfeel and it's creamy. Quite, it's a bit of saison -y almost. Yeah, very Saison kind of character, actually. Good point, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could even be a different yeast. It's so different to the first two. That's way different. Yeah. I think that's a different... That's got to be a different yeast, surely. Right. Well, I don't know. I, I couldn't find that in my research, but it does feel like a very different yeast, or it feels like very heavily adjuncted spice. I don't know, like lemon verbena or rosemary or... It's something in there that is just very citric and yeah. fresh. Yeah. As always with Belgians and Belgian brewers particularly, they keep their cards very close to their chests. Generally, it's hard to find out the details of these beers, and we will know that when we get to this mysterious anniversary beer uh, in a couple of minutes. But so th this is what the monks were drinking while they were sat on their gold thrones. Yeah. <laughs> we're never being invited to Chimay now. Um, and it, yeah, it's a delicious beer, I'm quite envious. I think I prefer it to West Malar Extra. It's um, it's definitely pretty crushable. I like I like the mouthfeel of it as mm. well. Very sort of like, sort of quite substantial little bubbles going on throughout, and I think that's being a good tr transport layer for those sort of herbal kind of things yeah. that happen in there. Yeah, it's I... like a fresh run for a field, Johnny. Exactly. Yeah, Theresa May through a through a wheat field style. Of beer. She'd love this beer. She would love this beer. I reckon she would. <laughs> um, right. Well, let's move on to... Essentially, this is kind of a, a session version of, of the white, which is the triple beer, which was introduced uh, in the late 60s. So just before they sort of made that call to be like, let's blow up. And probably very much a response to, say, the success of, of West Manor Triple and the Blom Lagers that were taken over Europe. And this, this is a, a, a straight up triple. It's the one I have the least notes on. Uh, and literally in my notes, it says it's a triple. It's a triple. Um, so let, let's try and dig out a little bit more because it's been a long time since I had Shimei White because you don't see it around a lot. You see the red and the blue everywhere. Mm. You don't see the triple around much. Almond croissant. I like the smell of this <laughs> better than the red and the blue. Right. Straight so, off. Yeah, it's... it's I, I get nail polish, almond, like marzipan, yeah. bready, brioche, croissant -y. It's pastries. Yeah, it's quite walking to a boulangerie. Away, yeah, yeah. away, the boulangerie. I'm drunk and I'm walking into a pastry. <laughs> <laughs> pastry. We've all been there. We've all been there on the in, in the morning, drunk in a bakery. Yeah, drunk yeah. in a bakery is a good descriptor for this. Yeah. Really lovely. I like it. Um, hop bitterness. Yeah, unexpected. Hops, Johnny. I'm gonna taste hops. Hops. So. I, th I believe that the, the red and the blue are brewed with hop extract. So they're not really looking for that much flavour um, and aroma, really. It's, it's to get the bitterness, maybe some character. This has a hop, uh, a, a hopper pop tingle, proper hop tingle uh, on the finish. Kind of a nettle bitterness, a kind of grassy kind of flavour on it. it. Sticks on your tongue, creates a kind of tannin which is nice with a really smooth, again, really smooth carbonation, like on this one, not yeah. like on these ones. And then it just carries that nice sort of dolce de leche, caramel, brioche sweetness that that we got when we said drunk in a bakery. I think it's pretty cheeky. I'm liking this one. Mm. 8%. It's, it's pretty uh, bluesy, but it doesn't, it doesn't like, it's not like crazy heavy again. Yeah, I mean, all of the Shime beers, and it's why I've always shied away from buying shimmy beers is i do get that kind of nail polish thing from pretty much all of the beers it's actually quite muted in the red but it was there in the blue is there here as well yeah and i presume it's going to be in both of these i don't love that flavor i think i'm quite sensitive to it but i know a lot of people either love it or aren't that sensitive to it so i think that can add an element of, of complexity and balance if you're not picking it up big time actually on here it's relatively muted on the aroma but it is there on the palate that said, I think it helps because it is kind of creamy, brown, buttery notes to it. Yeah. It's a really... I'm smiling when I talk about it, which is a great sign. It's a delicious yeah. beer. I think it's excellent. I mean, I know what I'm drinking both of those with, like big roasted meats, like we said. Kind of like, this is like a wintry type beer. This is bringing me, you know, summer, uh, daytime drink, danger drinking in the summertime. Yeah, maybe, 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 maybe sunset evening, drinking. Maybe evening. Yeah. To be fair, it might fall over if you drank one of these. Yeah. But um, it's a totally, I mean, I know it's a totally different style of beer, but it's like, I wouldn't even have expected it from the same brewery. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Such and a range already. Yeah. Both, both the blondes have been my favorite beers of yeah. this tasting. Yeah. Um, I, th I think they're, they're very nicely balanced and floral and, and fresh, but still 
Still a little bit boozy. I'm feeling the blood creeping Ooh. up on my cheeks. Me too. We put, we put this on our Patreon forum and we were like, uh, we were like, guess what we're about to do? And somebody just put, get a hangover? <laughs> Which is accurate. <laughs> Did you know that the first ever fridge was built for beer, not food? Or that surgeons learned that they should be washing their hands from somebody investigating sour beer? How about the fact that the Nazi party was formed over pints in a Munich beer hall and that brewer's yeast might just be the solution to climate change? Intrigued? Well then my new book might just be of interest. I'm super excited to say that my fourth book, The Meaning of Beer, is available for pre-order in hardback, ebook, and audiobook at the links in the description box below, all for delivery on the 7th of November. This book has taken me more than two years of research, traveling, and writing, and it's essentially a revisionist history of humanity, claiming that beer is our greatest invention, right up there with the discovery of fire and the creation of language. So as I say, the links are below. This beautiful book is out on the 7th of November in hardback, ebook, and audiobook, and I would absolutely absolutely love to hear from you if you've pre-ordered it or if you want me to come to your town and do a talk, have a few beers when this book is released. Love and beer. Beer number five, Bradley. So this was released for the 150th anniversary, um, but it was, it was so popular, they kept bringing it back. Okay. However, the internet doesn't really like it as far as I can tell. It's green. It's green. Is that not... Is that not a colour you you want to drink from a Trappist? Uh, green golds looks nice, doesn't it? I mean, they all, to be honest, they all look pretty nice. Yeah, we were talking about this before nice we filmed. Labels. They are beautiful, yeah. simple labels, and this one is just. just I, remember, a dead I swear, fancy. I remember them back in the day. Them being less busy, still like equally beautiful, but like less kind of like heraldic shit going on, maybe. <laughs> yeah, heraldic shit. Yeah, I really like the colour of it, Johnny. Yeah, it's a nice gold with a little bit of haze. Looks like a classic Belgian beer, really, doesn't it? And you said this is a 150th anniversary. I wouldn't celebrate it the way that Shimei did. With loads of herbs, is what you said. Well, yeah, so I'm just going to read this off my notes, right? Go on. This is what the brewery says you should get from this beer. Okay. Mint. Mm. Bergamot. Uh, yeah. Eucalyptus. No idea. Lime. Lime, I think, yeah. So we're, we're talking... Yeah. Bergamot is something I associate with like really nice candles and like expensive aftershave. I think of what your nan puts in her tea. Bergamot? Yeah. Put bergamot in tea? Old lady tea. It's giving me like a bit of Fisherman's Friend vibes. Like, like something a nan might give you a sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got a sore throat, have one of those. Yeah, child. 100%. And then you're like... Whoa, what is all this craziness? With beer brewed by monks, you know? Yeah, yeah. Beer de Sante, beer of health. Yes. Maybe that's what they're going for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's got a slightly medicinal quality to Definitely. it, doesn't it? Mm. But hey, let's see how it how it works when we when we taste it. <laughs> it's just baffling, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it... definite menthol vibes. Yeah, is it menthol? Is that what it is? It's a bit minty, isn't it? Yeah. Is it like a menthol cigarette? I've never tried one of these. I don't think I ever have either. But I think they're banned now, aren't they? If they're like because that... Because it tastes like that, it's yeah. probably banned it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not that bad. It's just like when you put it next it's to this... odd. You know, like, this is a beautiful world-class beer. Yeah. They, I, I just think they overthought it as a beer. I feel like I'm eating and, a candle, Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, a lot of candles in monasteries. May, yeah. may, maybe they got got wrong delivery. Amazon delivered the wrong box of candles and then they're like, oh, this, this monastery smells nice now. We should make a beer like this. When God gives you candles, Johnny, make green shimmy. Yeah, that invite. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, you have to brew something special, right? When it's your 150th birthday. And also within the parameters of Trappist styles, there's not a huge amount you can do to really stand out. But I also, I, ha I didn't love the Rochefort Triple. I thought that was overthought and over-fragranced. It seems to be the way that Belgians, Belgian monasteries celebrate. take, yeah, take, celebrate or take their modern twists on beer because Belgians are still pretty anti-hop as brewers. You know, like they don't throw want... loads of shit that isn't hops at it. Yeah, exactly that. We don't like IPA, so maybe we just throw a load of tea bags in. Um, what did you, what did baby Jesus get given when he was a baby? We'll, put, we'll and put all yeah. of that in a beer, in the green beer. And then put it in a green label, yeah. Um, so I'm not a fan of this beer whatsoever. I don't think I am. 
Uh, however, it does speak to Shimei's more outlandish, more adventurous yeah. approach. I respect it. And it's something that's going to pay off in dividends with this next beer, which I think is absolutely stunning. So if it's a Belgian beer with a cork, you know you're in for a ride. It's going to be interesting. And I'm, I'm excited to take you on this one because I had this beer many, many years ago. Well, I, th I think it actually would have been a different barrel. I think the barrels are kind of one off. I but really like the bottle, Johnny. I mean, we were talking about earlier. One of the most beautiful I think, things. I think it looks pretty expensive. Um, oh. You were saying they're about £15 maybe a bottle. Yeah, I mean, in terms of value for the quality of brewing, the history that you're investing in and the flavours that you're going to get. It's it barrel aged as well, yeah, with like all kinds of craziness. Well, yeah, so I haven't described what the beer is yet. So oh, this nice is a bit of smoke on it there, mate. On the opening. So this is a uh, Calvados barrel, brandy barrel, French brandy barrel aged version um, of the blue. So Grand Reserve means it's the blue. And then Fermente. Ooh, I'm not going to do the French. Fermented yeah. in barrels, mate. Um, so fermentation, so so in the fermenter, yeah. in the barrel, and then in the bottle. I mean, how much fermentation happens in the barrel? It's a lot. Not huge amounts, because I know they're not trying to get bread or anything, but there will have been interaction with the spirits in the barrel. Oh, yeah. It's I mean, literal spirits, not metaphorical. Interaction with, with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. No, well, no, I don't want to... I didn't want to go down that road, but we did. We did. Woof. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Nana. Brandy, oak splinters. Skim me. Give me really heady Christmas vibes again. Yeah. But like, but it's going... also because it's apple. Because apple, lots of the flavors in apple are fermentation characteristics. It just smells like walking into a wild ale brewery. It is and apple -y as hell. Yeah. It's like it's like a cooked apple yeah. kind of smell. Well, it's it? brandy. It's brandy. You know, yeah, it's, of course, it's, yeah. it's it's distilled cider, and it's just a gorgeous aroma, particularly on top of that kind of toffee caramel base of of the blue. Just smells great. And it it retains loads of that double character. But right up front, it is all sweet apple, toffee apple, and oak. And on the finish, it is all brandy. Feels like you've just sipped brandy. It's it's fusel, it's up in my nose, it's warming, it's heartening, it's taking a little bit of my voice away. It's boozy as hell. It's just, ah, oh, I'm uh, I'm so I'm silent in reverence of it, Johnny. I think that's pretty pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty special that. I also love I love the texture of it. It's kind of oily and boozy as well. It's just perfectly managed, perfectly balanced. I can only presume that they've you know they've blended this to get it absolutely perfect because the balance on it is just top notch. It's dry. It's oily. And it's sweet. It's all these things that shouldn't be possible together. It's I, just masterfully done. I love that that's in a beer. I think it's amazing. Yeah. It's very different to most beers I've tried, to be yeah. honest. It's really cool. It is really, really cool. And you're right, it is different because it. lots of the barrel-aged beers that we try in the craft beer industry are either very, very, very barrel-heavy mm. or they... Are sort of the, the the original beer was so full of character that it's just a nuance that's added. This beer is a proper combination of, of this classic Belgian dark ale and this classic French spirit. I love it. That just becomes its own kind of unique thing. It's a new Christmas tradition for me, I think. Yeah. At this point, maybe. And at 15 quid a bottle, it's probably cheaper than the, the other bubbles that are being bought for you. Certainly cheaper than brandy. That's yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think like that's the thing, right? It's got that brandy edge to it. The apples are kind of like lifting it, not making it feel too heavy and stodgy. It's got some sort of lightness to it, um, which is amazing. Yeah, I'm really, really into it. It's complex, it's dark, but it's also got that lightness. Zing. It's zing. Yeah, and I think I think some of that comes from oxidation, from the oak, from the brandy. Just everything's playing a part, and that's what makes it feel so balanced. Um, I was really surprised. I was really sceptical. And when they released the first one of these, which I think was bourbon barreled, I was like, I yeah, really want to drink Shimei doing that. I don't really get that. I don't really think they'll necessarily do a great job. And I tried that one. I was like, oh, hell. 
I was good. That's really good. I guess the sweetness of the bourbon. Bur- yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it made a lot of sense. It was just like it felt like something that a small artisanal brewery would do because they'd have the, I guess, the gumption to go for it. But they've not held back. They have got so much brandy character in this. So, yeah, I mean, that was a case of me being very biased and snobby. I think this is one of the best barrel-aged beers I've ever had. This is the kind of stuff that can blow minds and change minds. Transcendent. Transcendent. There I say. Such a strong word for it. So, yeah, like I said at the start of this, Shimei, not my favourite Trappist brewery, but actually, I mean, the, these two are great beers. I just think that there's there's better versions yeah, done agreed. by Trappist breweries. Yeah. These two, I think, are brilliant. Excellent days. This one is mad, and I'm sure there's an audience that loves it. Mental. I'd say try it. If you haven't tried it, give oh, it a 100%. go. Oh, 100%. Because it's crazy. Weird. Yeah. I mean, if you want to test your palate, yeah, that's yeah. the beer for you. But then this is, like you say, transcendent is the right word for it. It's just Chef's remarkable. kiss. Yeah. Incredible. Um, Shimei is a place we need to go. Uh, in fact, we need to go to all of the Trappist monasteries that have cafes. And we, we, I really hope that we can follow up this series with a uh, holy hell we actually went. Cafe culture. Cafe, yeah. Cafe culture. Um, and if we do, I would love if we could get inside to um, learn more about the process of making this and some of the recipe tweaks that are throughout this. Of course, because of the stuff we said in this video, that's never going to happen. But we can, we can but dream. A beautiful dream. <laughs>